How do you break into a new game code base? And how do you understand how it works efficiently? This is a question that kept me thinking for a little while. You see, as game programmers, we are always meeting new code bases. Whether we are starting a new job, joining a new project, or trying to explore a new engine feature, or a new plugin. And we might be lucky and find that such code bases are using unit tests, are well documented, and the documentations are up to date, and maybe even the developers who wrote it are still working on it. Well, that's every programmer's hope. And in real scenarios, we rarely find such code bases. Instead, we find ourselves working in a code base that is not documented, the documents are not up to date, and the developers who wrote it are no longer working on it. And even worse, it might be unreadable or doesn't adhere to any good standards. So, what do you do when you find yourself in such scenario? How do you break into this unfamiliar territory? And how do you understand legacy code efficiently? This topic intrigued me for a little while. I felt that it was underrated. Or maybe I was looking into the wrong places. Why most of the resources that I've studied focused on how to write better code and not how to read code better. And I even remember the time when I was freelancing and I got asked by a client what would be the steps that I would take in order to understand some system and integrate that system in their code base. And because my answer back then was very poor and imprecise, I didn't get the job. And even worse, I didn't know what was wrong with my answer. So. For the past little while, I started exploring how to understand legacy code efficiently and how to break into any new code base. And today, I want to share with you the lessons that I've learned as we explore a practical example in Project Lira. And I know that Lira might not be the best example since it's way better than the average code bases that we meet in real life. But at the same time, it's a very good example that it allows us to demonstrate most of, if not all of the techniques that we can use to understand legacy code efficiently. So, today we'll be writing some code and taking some notes that you can find in my Patreon. And I want to thank everyone who is supporting this content and helping me do better. Let's start by downloading Lira from the sample projects in Unreal's marketplace. And the first thing that we need to do is to simply play the game get familiar with its different features. This is a crucial step, especially if we are not someone who is used uh, to playing shooting games and does, is not familiar with their mechanics. We need to get more familiar with the weapons, the abilities that the player have, the enemies spawning, the different game modes. Simply, we get familiar with the different features that the game provides as an end user would do. Once we get more familiar with the project features and how it works, the next thing that we want to do is to define a specific goal that we need to learn and assign ourselves a couple of bite-sized tasks. And by bite-sized task, I mean that it is a task that is focused on a specific system and can be finished within a couple of hours. If we are working on a team environment, we would have been assigned a task already since there would be something like an onboarding process usually. But since we are working alone, a couple of good candidate tasks that can get us more familiar with Lyra, let's say if we want to focus on the weapons and the equipment system, maybe to add a cheat code to give a weapon or to drop a weapon or to refill ammo, for example. And maybe if we want to get more familiar with the ability system, maybe we can create a new gameplay effect or create a new gameplay ability. And if you want to learn more about the experience side and the game modes, maybe we can modify the rules of an existing game mode and its win and lose conditions you got the idea. The main thing that we need is that the task be specific and focused on one system and it can be finished within a couple of, within a couple of hours. To keep this very really short and simple, I'll focus on creating a cheat code to refill ammo. So, we have assigned ourselves a couple of bite-sized tasks. What do we do next? Do we jump straight into code like we are jumping into a cold shower? Or better, we take it slowly and read the documentations first to get a high overview of the system. What we are trying to do in this step is to try to identify and get familiar with any internal terms or glossary that the system is using to describe something. 
and to get familiar with any architecture patterns or design patterns that the system is using, like MVC, MVP, or something else. And maybe try to identify any dependency on an external third-party tool or an engine or a marketplace plugin that would be a prerequisite for us. And lastly, and most importantly, is to try to identify the important modules and class names that are related to the system that we are working on and try to understand how these classes and modules depend on each other, how they are structured, and how they talk to each other. But looking at the documentation, we see it explains the concept of experiences and shows dependency on the gameplay features plugin. It shows us that the weapon system we are interested in is part of the shooter core gameplay feature module. And diving deeper into the documentation of Lira's inventory and equipment, we learn about the definition and distinction between inventory and equipment. We get some insights on data types, objects lifetime, when these inventory items or equipments are created and what are the differences between them, who gets ownership of items, and how these items are associated and depending on each other. And then we get a high overview of what's called as inventory fragments and how items are consisting of inventory fragments. And we identify some important class names for both the inventory and the equipment systems and what they do. For example, the inventory manager components that manage all the inventory items, what is an inventory item definition, and what is a name of some asset examples that we can look up in the editor, and what is an inventory fragment. And the same for equipment. There is something called an equipment manager component that seems like it manages equipment, and there is something called an equipment instance, and again, a com an equipment definition. Thanks to the documentation. Now we have a very good high overview of the system. We know the differences between an inventory and an equipment, and we know the names of the important class names and what they do, so we have a good starting point into code. Now back to the task we have in hand, which is creating a cheat code to refill ammo. To solve this problem, we can break it down and answer two questions first, which are how do we create a cheat in Lyra, and the second is how do we add ammo to open. Let's start with the latter question. And the best way to answer that, that I know of, is to do what we do when we don't know what to do. In other words, we look at how something similar was implemented. In our case, we try to identify and understand how the logic, the existing logic, of adding ammo to a, to a weapon is implemented. And from the documentations, what we got is that items are consisting of something called an inventory fragment, and that especially the inventory fragment set stats is what gives attributes or gameplay tags to items. So, to ensure that the documentation is not outdated or not fooling us, Let's try to find a use of this inventory fragment set stats in our content or assets and try to modify its values. We know also from the documentation that any item definition is prefixed with id underscore, short for item definition. So if we open our content browser and search with control B for id underscore, we find a list of item definitions showing up for us. If you open one of them, let's say the rifle, we can see within it there is a couple of inventory fragments. Within these, there is one called the inventory fragment set stats. Within it, it has an initial stats map. And within it, we can find that there are some gameplay tags related to ammo and they have initial integer values. So let's modify the values that are associated with the gameplay tags that are related to ammo to understand their impact. And now we are more confident those tags have an impact and the documentation is not fooling us. What we just did to find the initial item stats map is the first step in a technique known as diving into code from its edges, from inputs or outputs. And this first step, which is finding an entry point or checkpoint, aka digging, is what makes us better or more efficient at learning any code base or any new system. So, once we get a good starting point, the next step that we need to do is to use our debugging tools to find the definition and the references for this initial item stats map, which is also known as breaking. And here's where knowing our debugging tools can come in handy and using a tool like Visual Assist or eSharper can make this process much faster. We know that our inventory fragment underscore set stats class is a C++ class. So, let's open Visual Studio and use the code search feature 
to locate the definition of the initial item stats map. Once we are at the definition of it, we can right click on it and find references. And if we look at those references, we can see an interesting one where the gameplay tags that are part of this initial item stats map get added to item instances. And this happens inside the on instance created function. This is an interesting function, especially the call to add tag 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 function. But still, one thing is missing for our cheat function to work properly. We need a way to access all weapon instances to be able to call the add stat tag stack function on them. We can set a breakpoint and follow the call stack of where this call came from. And following the call stack leads us into the ULira inventory manager component. If you recall from the documentation, this class is the one that manages and contains weapons and inventory item instances. So there is probably a function here that retrieves item instances. And if you look at its member functions, we can find two of them. One that returns all items, and the other one returns an item instance if we give it an item definition. Now we know how to retrieve item instances. Let's recap our findings of how our cheat function for adding ammo or refilling ammo should work. First, we reach the inventory manager component, owned by our player controller, as stated in the documentation. Then we will call get all items from the inventory manager component to retrieve the item instances. And then for each item instance, we will check if it has the gameplay tags of magazine ammo and spare ammo, and thus determine if it is a ranged weapon. If it's a ranged weapon, we will find the default ammo values for the ammo gameplay tags through the function called find fragment by class, and then get item stat by tag. Once we have the value for each ammo tag, we will call add stat tag stack function for each ammo tag to finally update and refill the ammo. Now this might be a lot. So let's take an effective break. But to make this break effective, we need to do two things. The first is we need to write down our notes and refine them so that our findings are clear and are not lost. And the next important thing is that we need to write down what is the next step that we are going to get back to once we are back from this break. So we're not lost trying to figure out what was the last thing that we stopped at and what we were we trying to do. Once we are back from the break, let's start by answering the question that we stated earlier, which is how can we create a cheat in Lira? We are going to use the same process that we used in order to understand how the logic for adding ammo is implemented. We're going to find a good starting point. And here's where a little familiarity with Unreal's cheat manager system can be helpful in tackling this task. As it lets us know that in order to trigger a cheat, we need to open the console command and type in the cheat name. And since we don't know what are the cheat names within Lyra, what we can do is just open the console and search for the word cheat. And we can see two search results coming out for us. These can be a good starting point for us in order to understand how cheats are created and how someone did something similar to what we are trying to do. So, once we got our good starting point, the next step would be to use our debugging tools and search for the references and the definition of this starting point. So once again, I'm opening Visual Studio and using its code search feature to search for the word Lira cheat. And immediately, I can find the class called Lira cheat manager. This is probably the class where all cheats would exist. We can find that the results that we found earlier in the console commands are actually console variables and not cheats. But looking further into the file, we can find more cheats declared and implemented. To ensure we are using the right cheat manager or, this, or these cheats are working, what we can do is simply open the console command and use or type in one of these cheat names. Once we are sure it's working, now we are ready to create our refill ammo cheat. And let's review our notes to get reminded of its implementation details. Now the fun part comes. Let's compile our code, jump into the editor, and test our refill ammo cheat. But before moving on, there's one thing that I don't like about our implementation, and I'm not sure if we have implemented it properly, which is we are hard coding the gameplay tags. What if those change later? This not, doesn't seem like a very good practice. So 
let's make it as an excuse to ask questions. And I know for this example, we don't have anyone to ask. But since Lyra is an open project, we can look up at any of Unreal, Discord communities, or Epic Dev community, or Lyra specific communities. And I was lucky to be referred by my colleague about the Lyra DevNet Discord server. So before asking, let's make sure that nobody has asked this question before. And it seems that some people did it before us. So it seems our implementation is acceptable after all. And if we later on wanted to remove these hard coded values, we can introduce a variable that we can set from the editor or somewhere else. Now that was a very good process, but to make it yet more effective, what we can do is to draw what's known as a mental map. This mental map allows us to understand and form the bigger picture of how the classes, the functions, and the modules that we have studied relate and depend on each other. And since we are using Unreal, two tools that we can utilize in order to draw this dependency graph or mental map are the class viewer and the reference viewer. What the class viewer allows us to do is to see the inheritance hierarchy for our classes. If, for example, we search for id underscore rifle, we can see its inheritance hierarchy. And if you open the reference viewer on the id underscore rifle and then filter by blueprints, we can find what blueprints does it depend on and what blueprints depend on it. And thus, we create this dependency graph in nearly no time. But since the reference viewer does only work with blueprints for C++ classes, a quick solution that we can use is an external graph dependency viewer tool like clang, endbend, or understand. I've tried to extend the reference viewer to include C++ classes, but that seemed that needs more refinement and more time that I don't have at the moment. But let me know in the comments if you are interested in another video that covers the reference viewer and how we can extend it and maybe how dependencies are created in the first place. To be honest, the example that we have shown today is way better than the average legacy code that we meet every while. But at the same time, it was a good example that allowed us to demonstrate the different techniques that we can utilize in order to understand and break into any legacy code or any foreign code base, which is a skill that I advise myself to practice on a regular basis. And who knows, maybe within a couple of years, I'll look back at this video and the techniques that I mentioned today are outdated or no longer make sense to me and I've replaced them with better ones. If you want some further reading, I highly recommend taking a look at the resources in the description below especially the Understanding Legacy Code website, and maybe consider subscribing to its weekly newsletter. And if you want to access my notes and the cheat code function that we wrote today, consider subscribing to my Patreon. A big thank you to the awesome people supporting this content. This was Amr, and as always, thank you for making it to the end of this video.